Father in heaven, we thank you that you have always been there. Before the mountains were built, before the oceans were filled with water, before the stars were flung into their orbit, before the first signs of life appeared on this planet of ours, before the first man looked up, we thank you that you were there. We praise you that you will always be there. Other things we know will pass away. Those mountains and oceans and even those stars will one day go. And even the heavens will be rolled up like a blanket. But you will still be there. And we praise you for this tremendous sense of security that in a changing world which it's so disturbed and so shaken in which kingdoms rise and fall and the atlas changes every week, that you are still there. But we praise you also this morning, Father, because you are here, not just in the distant heavens, but by your Holy Spirit, among your people and in their hearts. And without your presence, we would be wasting our time. Come to us, we pray, O Lord. We praise you that you want us far more than we could ever want you. That you love us more deeply than we can possibly imagine. And every one of us has some reason for praising you this morning. Through sleep and darkness safely brought. And when we consider the wonderful processes of our bodies that restored consciousness and life and strength to us, and the rest you gave us during the hours of darkness, we praise you for that, even though we so often take it for granted. But there are other more direct blessings we've enjoyed. We thank you for protection this week from danger. We thank you for answered prayer. We thank you for arranging our lives so that we had such unexpected and delightful surprises. We met people we didn't expect to meet, and, and then we realized you wanted us to meet them. We thank you for letters received that were a little breath of heaven to us. We thank you for conversations with your saints that lifted us up to nobler desires to be more nearly what we ought to be, to be more worthy of our prayers and praise. It's so easy, Lord, to talk to you in the peace and quiet of this fellowship and the joy and love of your saints, but we've got to live out in the world for the rest of the week. And we thank you for your presence there too. So make this day a real day. Make it a day of gladness. Make it a day of worship. And if any strangers are among us, help them to feel that they belong to us if they belong to you. And may your church throughout the world be edified, built up, strengthened, and used for your glory this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that let us take our Bibles. We shall be jumping about in the first book of Samuel and the first 16 chapters. The gift of prayer can be passed on from generation to generation. And we're going to look this morning at a mother who was a wonderful woman of prayer and a son who became a man of prayer. He did not become a man of prayer because she taught him to pray, but because she prayed. And the first thing I want to say this morning is this. Many parents teach their children to pray, and many children stop praying when they become adults. And do you know why? Because they don't know that their parents pray. If you really want your children to pray, it is far more important that you demonstrate that you pray than that you teach them to pray. And I remember the day, as a tiny boy, I rushed into a room and found my parents pouring out their hearts to the Lord, which taught me more about prayer than them teaching me to say, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, before I went to sleep. And indeed, the prayer is passed on from this mother to this son, not by direct teaching, but because the woman's life was drenched in prayer. 
and therefore the boy was brought up in an atmosphere of prayer and later he came himself to discover the secrets of prayer. He didn't discover it until he left home. But as soon as he left home, he found that the prayer his mother had found so real became his too. Now the mother is Hannah and the son is Samuel. I remember going to Berlin for the World Congress on Evangelism and 1,600 evangelists gathered together on the edge of the uh, Iron Curtain there, the Berlin Wall, in the Great Congress Hall near the Brandenburg Gate. And in all that company there were four women out of 1,600 men. And Bishop Shandu Ray, that great saint of God who's had such a mighty ministry in Pakistan and elsewhere in Asia, he got up and he spoke and he looked around. Then he told us about his mother. And he said, we've got a conference here on evangelism. Where are the mothers? Never forget that. Now the amazing thing is that his mother was not a Christian. She was a Buddhist. But she was a woman of prayer. And when later Shandu Ray came to Christ, the atmosphere of a Buddhist mother's prayer was an influence in making him a man of prayer. She didn't get her prayers answered. She prayed to the God, she prayed to all sorts of people and things. She never got any answers. But the fact that she was even praying helped to make Shandure a man of prayer. When a mother prays to the real God and gets answers to the prayer, then that's going to have a profound influence on the children. For it is not just that parents pray, the greatest demonstration to children is when parents get answers to prayer. And when the children say, how did that happen? And the parent is able to say, because I prayed. That's going to be the decisive factor. And if our children never see answers to our prayers, can we blame them if they stop asking God when they become adults? Now let's look at Hannah, a mother. And the interest in Hannah's prayers lies in the content of her prayers, what she said. Whereas we shall find that the interest of Samuel's prayers don't lie in what he said because we hardly ever know what he said. It lies more in the context, the situations in which he prayed and the kind of answers he got. And this morning I want to focus all your attention on answers to prayer. What happened when the mother prayed? What happened when the son prayed? Now, the, the prayer of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 is the first recorded prayer of a woman in the Bible. And it's the last recorded prayer of a woman in the Old Testament as far as I can find out. There is only one woman's prayers recorded in Scripture. All the more reason why we should give further attention to it and learn, especially you mothers, you ladies, learn from Hannah how to pray. And the prayer is in verses 9 to 13. We'll just read the prayer, and then I'll talk about it and tell you why she prayed this prayer and what happened. Verse 10 we'll start at. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant but will give to thy maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. That last phrase contrasts to a lot of mother's prayers today. Well now let's look at this prayer. What was this very deep personal distress that caused her to weep before the Lord? She was one of two wives of a man. He shouldn't have had two wives. God had told them from the very beginning they shouldn't, but I'm afraid that very often patterns of behavior slip away from God, and even people who profess to be God's people slip away, and this man took two wives. I remember somebody saying to me, one thing the good Lord never intended was two women to share the same kitchen. And this is what happened here to cause the distress. There was jealousy, irritation, difficulty, and it focused in one simple thing. 
The other wife had lots of children and she had none and the other wife teased her, provoked her, ridiculed her, said, what sort of a wife do you think you are? I can produce children for him, you can't. And you can imagine the distress this caused to a sensitive woman. So she came and she cried bitterly to the Lord about her problem. There were no doctors or clinics she could have gone to anyway to discuss this. She tried to have babies often enough, she hadn't had any. So she came to God and she said this prayer. It's a very personal prayer, so personal that she didn't say it out loud. It's the first recorded case of silent prayer in Scripture. Her mouth moved, but no sounds came. It made somebody there think she was drunk, her weeping and mouthing. But she was just mouthing a prayer. You don't even need to speak out loud. God knows the words of our mouths before they're on our tongue. And it was a silent prayer, but we know what she prayed. She must have written it down, told somebody else and got it here. Samuel, presumably. And he's written it down for us. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is her request. She did not say, give me grace to put up with this ridicule. She said, give me a baby. That's bold. She didn't just say, give me grace to accept my circumstances. She did say, change my circumstances. And that's a prayer of tremendous faith in the circumstances. But she was so humble about it. Three times she said, I'm only your slave, your maidservant. That word comes three times in the first sentence. Your maidservant, your maidservant, your maidservant. I'm just a poor little thing, but give me a baby so that the, this whole situation may be changed. It was a special petition from a woman in anguish. But now I want you to notice this. Added to her request was a resolve. If you will give this baby to me, I will give the baby back to you for his whole adult life. If thou wilt give, then I will give. Now here is a prayer that is not selfish. She is willing to ask for something from God in order that it may be used for God. And God loves a prayer like that. I once challenged a congregation whether they had ever asked God for a rise in salary. Now, of course, when you're just asking for anything that you want, of course you ask God for more money before you've learned what you should be praying for. But I challenged the congregation Four days later, I got this letter. You may recollect that last Sunday, you asked us if we had ever asked the Lord for a rise in salary in order to channel more money into his work. For I had made this point, if thou will give, then I will give. Well, for quite a time now, I've found it more and more difficult to make ends meet to help others and to help support the Christian causes in which I'm interested. For years, I put a set sum by each week for definite missionary work, but lately have found this impossible. I know people say if you tithe, you'll find nine-tenths go as far as ten-tenths, but it didn't work out like that for me. It's a very honest letter. She'd been on a fixed salary for ten years. You know what was happening to the cost of living. Now she says, but it worried me that I haven't been supporting the Lord's work financially as I used. Then about 10 o'clock last night, I remembered what you had said, and I just laid the situation before the Lord, and I asked him to provide the means for me to still give donations where I felt led. At 10 o'clock this morning, the office manager called me into his room to say that they were going to raise my pay and buy the exact amount which I had always given to the Lord. I was so thrilled at such a prompt answer to prayer that my figures went astray for a while. Our firm is well known for being poor payers, so this makes it all the more miraculous. Now she took me up, and that woman went home. She didn't do it cheaply. She didn't just say, fine, I found a quick way to get more money. She went home and she said, Lord, I want to give to you. Therefore, I'm asking that you will give to me, because I can't give to you until you give to me. That's down to earth and it's real and it's the kind of prayer that Hannah prayed. If you will give me a son, I'll give him to you. And she offered him back. And this is what we do in a dedication service. It's 
wonderful to be able to say the Lord hath taken away and say it calmly. It's even more wonderful to say he didn't have to take it away, I gave it. Didn't have to take him or her away, I gave him or her. And that's what Hannah resolved to do. Well now, the next prayer of Hannah and the only other one recorded is in chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and it is 12 years later. And now she is going to have to fulfill the resolve that she had made 12 years before. Now this is a big test. It's easy enough to make a promise and then never have to keep it for 12 years, and then 12 years later be faced with it. I'm quite sure I have told you of a boy who came to me once and said, I'm in real trouble with my parents. I believe God has called me to the mission field and they refuse to let me go because they're retired now and I'm the only one living at home. And I went to see those parents and said, did you dedicate this boy when he was a baby? Oh yes, they said, of course we did. We've got the certificate upstairs. And I had to say, well now, you must do what you said you would do when you gave him to the Lord. And Hannah, 12 years later, gave away that boy to the Lord's work. And this is the prayer she prayed at that time, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Hannah also prayed and said, My heart exults in the Lord. Now bear in mind she was about to lose her boy, her only boy. My heart exults in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides thee. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. That doesn't sound at all like a woman's prayer, does it? Yet it was a woman who prayed it. It would be much more likely for a woman to pray about God's love. Instead, his holiness, his power, these are the things that fill her prayer now. And indeed, this is proof that she had grown in prayer over the, those 12 years. She does not pray a natural mother's prayer, but a supernatural prayer. She begins, of course, as you might expect, with her feelings. She's got loads of feelings. Her heart's bubbling over. My heart exults. It's excited. I've been lifted up. And she's able now to deride her enemies, those who mocked her because she believed in God. She's able to say, now, God has the last word. Here's a woman with all the feelings of victory and joy. She's known that God can save a situation. And she rejoices in the salvation. Now, that's quite natural. But now she praises God for what he is. Her prayer is based on facts, not feelings. The fact of God's holiness. This makes him unique. There is no one like God. No one so reliable as God. She thinks of God's knowledge and says to people, be careful what you say. God knows what you say about me or anyone else. Don't be arrogant in your mouth. God knows. And then she praises God for his power, that he can lift someone from the bottom right to the top, and he can take someone from the top and push them to the bottom. We're in a world in which people are pushing around and trying to get up the ladder of social life and full of ambition. But God sits in heaven 
and he says the meek will inherit the earth. God can reverse positions just like that. He can take fishermen and cobblers and he can make them kings and priests and set them on thrones. And he can take kings and emperors and dictators and plunge them to the dust. She praises him for his power to do with human beings what he wills. And then she praises him for his righteousness, for his moral principles. God doesn't just knock a man down or lift another up arbitrarily for no reason at all. He lifts the humble and those who pray and those who live for him, and he brings down the wicked. You can always see why God lifted someone and why God knocked them down. His righteousness. What a remarkable prayer. And it finishes with a word of prophecy. An incredible word of prophecy. Hannah, at the end of this wonderful prayer, says he will give strength to his king. And there was no king. And there never had been a king in Israel. And her son was going to choose the first two kings in Israel, Saul and David, and more than that, from her own loins and from her own family tree, there would come later royal people, kings and priests, and from her own nation would come the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's amazing that this woman turned prayer into prophecy and saw the future. Now I'll give you the happy ending to Hannah's story. She finished up with three sons and two daughters, apart from the one that she lost when he went back to the Lord at the age of 12. It's a lovely story of a woman who in distress turned to the Lord and asked the Lord to do something about it. And Hannah must forever stand out as one of the greatest godly mothers of all time. Now then we turn from the mother to the son. And Samuel's name is interesting. When she got this little boy, she thought, what shall I call him? And she said, well, I'm going to call him El, which is the Hebrew for God. El, God. And then she thought, well, I'd like a longer name than that. And she thought of Samuel, which means in Hebrew, I asked. I asked. Samuel, I asked God. Isn't that a lovely name for a boy? And I'm quite sure that when he got older and went to school or mixed with other children, he would come back one day and say, Mommy, why did you give me such a funny name? They all tease me about it at school. Samuel. And she said, well, sit down and I'll tell you. Because I would never have had you if I hadn't asked God. I had no little boys for many, many years, and I wanted one so badly. And I asked God, and here you are. So that's why I've called Samuel. I can imagine the little lad being thrilled with that and running back to tell his pals, tell you why I'm here, because my mummy asked God. Now this would mean that from his very earliest days, he knew that prayer was not only heard but answered, and that a woman can ask in faith and get an answer. And this would be the very atmosphere every time he signed his name. He would write, asked of God, and there the very hand that wrote it was the answer to that prayer. It's no wonder that he became a man who was constantly asking God for things in prayer. Now, there are recorded in the Bible six prayers of Samuel, only six, terribly brief, in at least three cases were not even told what he said. And the interest in these six prayers lies in the situation and the answer that came, the answers are given in full. And there's a pattern in the six answers. The first answer is bad, the second is good, the third is bad, the fourth is good, the fifth is bad, the sixth is good. And interestingly enough, the bad answers are all in words, and the good answers are all in deeds, words of God and deeds of God. He always got an answer, but three times it was not the kind of answer he really wanted. That is part of the reason why we miss God's answer to our prayer, because we only want the answer we wanted, and therefore we are deaf and we miss it. But he always answered Samuel's prayers, sometimes with some rather startling statements. 
I'm going to sort these out. Instead of taking them one to six, I'm taking one, three, and five, the bad ones, which are all the same kind and are all unwelcome answers of God's word, and then we'll take the three good ones. So if you can just bear in mind that I've unraveled the sandwich a bit and you can go home and put it together again. Each time in the bad answers or the hard answers, the unwelcome answers, something had gone wrong within the people of God. And the answer was always, go and give them some bad news. Now it's not easy when God says that. When God says there's something wrong with you and that's why the situation is as it is, go and tell them this bad news. Now I'm quite sure that 99% of you know the story of Samuel as a boy in the temple. And yet I am equally sure that nothing like 99% of you know what God said when Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. We're marvels at licking the jam out of the Bible and leaving the rest. We always stop reading at the crucial point when something unpleasant is likely to come up, and so we know the nice bits beautifully. We all know that Samuel, as a boy of twelve, was lying one night with the old priest whom he served in the next room, and he heard the voice, Samuel, Samuel, and he ran into the old man and said, Here I am, and he said, Well, I didn't say anything. You've been dreaming. Go and lie down. Second time, Samuel, Samuel, ran in again. The old man said, I didn't call. Go and lie down. Third time, the third time Eli, a discerning old man, said, You know, I think I know what's happening to you. I think God is trying to get through to you. Isn't it lovely when an old man, when a parent, when a senior saint can say to a young person who's troubled about something, you know, I think God is trying to say something to you in this. And that set Samuel's foot, the first step on the journey that was to lead to his ministry for God. Oh, he was busy in the temple. He was a kind of caretaker in the temple. But he didn't know God. It states that, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Do you know, God can speak to you hundreds of times, and before you know the Lord, you don't recognize it. You don't realize that he's trying to get through. And then when you come to know the Lord, you look back over your life and you say, why, he spoke to me then and then and then, I can see it now. He called me, Samuel, Samuel, or whatever your name is, and you didn't realize it was God trying to get into your life. He didn't know the Lord. You can be in the temple. You can be what he was, a server at the altar, and not know the Lord. And therefore, of course, your prayers don't become real, and God tries to speak, and you're deaf. And so Eli said, now go and lie down. So he went and lay down. Do you know what God said? Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth, said Samuel. And God said, what did he say? That was Samuel's first prayer. Here am I, speak. I'm ready to listen. Do you know what God said to Samuel was so terrible that when Eli said in the morning, what did God say? Samuel said, I don't tell you, can't tell you. What did God say? What God had to say was about Eli's sons. They were terrible boys. Well, they were grown up now, they were priests now. And all they thought about was food and women. And they were the leaders of the nation. And Eli's two boys, and Eli was blind to this, or if he saw it, he wouldn't take any criticism of his two boys. Parents are often like this. They protect their young too much. And Eli protected his boys, Hophni and Phinehas, they were called, the sons of Eli. And they were going to wreck the religious life because Eli was getting old and the two boys were taking over. And when the food was brought for the altar and the offerings, they would say, there's a nice steak, and they'd grab it and run off with it and have it. And any women who came into the temple, they would abuse them and take them off too. It was a dreadful situation. And God said to this little 12-year-old boy, I'm going to bring it all to an end, and Hophni and Phinehas will die the same day. Fancy telling a 12-year-old boy that. That was the first answer to the first prayer of that boy. 
The morning came round and Samuel was frightened. And he didn't want to meet Eli and he met Eli and Eli said, what did God say to you? Samuel said, no, I don't want to tell you. He said, don't hide it from me. Come on, boy, tell me. What did God say? And Samuel stuttered and stammered and he said, your two boys are going to die the same day. Your priesthood is finished. I can imagine Samuel almost cringing back and saying, I didn't say that, it was he said that. Frightened in case Eli would attack him or something. But Eli said this, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And it then says this, Samuel grew and became a mighty prophet of the Lord. Why? Because he passed the first test, which is, are you willing to tell the word of God to people even though it will be hard? Even though it will not be welcome? Even though it will hurt? Even though it may be bad news? Are you prepared to tell them? And Samuel passed the test at the age of 12. He became a great prophet. I remember visiting Rama, Samuel's home, and looking at that hill. There are only a few little mud houses there now. It's a very small little hamlet. And I remember thinking, there, there was the man who became the great prophet. I remember seeing the little signpost to Shiloh down a deserted road and thinking again of Hannah. She lived at Shiloh. And all these realities came back to me. These were real people. And this boy at 12 was willing to speak the truth for God. Now the second prayer is in chapter 8, verse 6. This was even harder. The people of Israel came to Samuel and they said, we want a king. We want a king to rule over us. The first time they'd ever asked such a thing. Do you know why they wanted a king? Because Samuel had made his own two boys judges in Israel and they too were rotten. It is the hardest thing in the world for a saintly parent to cope with a sinful child. It's one of the greatest agonies there can be. Some of you have faced that and you know what it's like. And Samuel's sons, whom he appointed to be judges and lead the nation, took bribes and perverted justice. The situation was in a mess. And so the people were rejecting Samuel's heavenly father and Samuel's earthly sons when they asked for a king. They were saying, we don't want your boys. And Samuel chapter 8 verse 6, Samuel prayed to the Lord. Doesn't say what he said. Now he was facing what Eli had faced, a couple of sons who were bad and who were not fit to take over. And Samuel prayed. It was a hard answer. God gave an answer. He said, Samuel, you'll have to give them a king. He won't be good for them. He'll be bad for them, but you'll have to give them one. You must warn them what he will be like. And again, Samuel had the unpleasant task of giving them bad news. You can have your king, but I'll warn you what he will do. It will go to his head. He'll make slaves of you. He'll drive you into battles that are unnecessary. That's what kings do. You can have one. God says, instead of my sons, but I must tell you this bad news. Again, he passed the test. Do you know one of the most startling texts in the Bible? God gave them their desire and sent leanness into their soul. Be careful what you ask for in prayer. God may give it to you. And your soul may become lean. The third prayer like this is in chapter 15, verse 11. The king was given and his name was Saul. Oh, he was a great big man. He had the physique of a baseball player. He had the looks of a film star. He was great and he could dress up and he could lead them into battle. He was a figurehead. He was the best looking king for miles around. But he wasn't a very good man. He wasn't an obedient man to God. And one day God said to this king Saul, there is a people here who have become so perverted that you must go and deal with them and get rid of them. And they were ruled over by a king called Agag. And God said to Saul, 
I appoint you as my agent to execute that king. Go and deal with him. Capital punishment. And so Saul set off. And he went there. He won the battle against the king. But when he saw the loot, which he was not supposed to touch, he took it and he brought all the flocks back. And because he brought the flocks, he let the king off. And King Agag was not put to death. And then he had the cheek to come into the temple and offer the lambs that he'd brought back as loot. God had said, kill them all. Don't touch anything that belongs to a wicked man like that. But he brought it back and then offered it to God, thinking that that would make it all right. I remember a man once coming into a vestry of a church where I was minister 20 years ago or so. And he came in and he offered me a large sum of money and we needed it at that time. But I said, just a minute, where did you get this money? because he certainly didn't normally have that, and I'm quite sure he, he wasn't worth that. And I said, where did you get it? And finally, after talking, he admitted he'd won it on the football pools. And he'd felt guilty about this. And he was trying to salve his conscience by getting some of it into the church. And if I had accepted some of it, he would have thought the rest was okay. But you see, gambling is clearly against the will of God. It's against love of neighbor. How can I love my neighbor and try and get money out of his pocket for nothing? It's just clearly wrong. And this is what Saul did. He thought that provided he gave a bit of the loot to God, that made the rest all right for him. Don't ever think that way. If God has said, don't touch a thing, you don't touch it. Even if you think you can give some to God, you keep away from it. And Samuel heard about this and he prayed. It's in chapter 15, verse 11. And all it says is this. Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. That's all. And you know what God told him to do? You can see what happened in verse 33. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. A tough job. A hard answer to his prayer. God said, Samuel, go and put this right straight away. And Samuel had to go and do that job that should never have been his, but he went and did it. There's an awful lot of sentiment talked about, would you be prepared to pull the lever or press the button? If God says so, has a person any other choice? And God said to Samuel, you must go and do this. Now those were the three hard answers. And Samuel passed the test every time. He got an answer every time, and God made him say or do something very difficult. But he did it. Now look at the other prayers. In each of the other three cases, it was quite a different context. In each of the other three cases, he prayed because of an enemy outside attacking him. And in every case, God gave deliverance. First it was the Philistines, then the Ammonites, and then the Amalekites. When something was wrong inside, God gave a hard answer and said, do the difficult thing and put it right. But when something was attacking from outside, God rushed to answer the prayer for protection and help. And these three prayers are all the same. First chapter 7 verse 9 is at a place called Mizpah. It's a battlefield prayer. It's in verse 9. So Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. Why did he take the lamb? He didn't take the lamb in any of the three prayers I mentioned earlier. Because earlier in verse 6, the people said, We have sinned against the Lord. And therefore the prayer was based on penitence. And they said, look, Lord, we know we're not worthy. We know we're sinners. We know we're not right. But we're being attacked. Will you help us? And it was accompanied by fasting, too. And prayer plus fasting is a powerful combination. When did you last try it? Pray and fast. Jesus said in one situation, this kind will not come forth except through prayer and fasting. Do without food and get on your knees and pray. That's powerful prayer. And so they prayed, and the Philistines 
were sent packing by God. The second prayer is in chapter 12, verse 18. Similar situation, the Ammonites are there. This time, Samuel realizes again that they are not worthy to have the prayer answered, and he asks God to discipline Israel by ruining the harvest, and a thunder and rainstorm does so. And now, Samuel says, now will you repent and pray with me to God for deliverance from the Ammonites? And they did, and God delivered them. And after that, when they were going to battle, Samuel said a thing which is a text you could underline in your Bible, verse 23 of chapter 12. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Do you realize that if someone's going through a battle that you could be praying for, and you stop praying for them, you sin against the Lord, as well as against them. And Samuel said, you go and fight the Ammonites now, get into that battle, and God forbid that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Here's a man who's discovering that the way to help people through a battle is to go on praying, to go on asking for the victory for them. And the final prayer in this series is in chapter 16. It takes place at Bethlehem, and now the enemy are the Amalekites. These were all real people. I know they sound funny names, these Ammonites and Amalekites, and as someone else said, all the parasites around the land of Canaan. But they were real enemies, and this is the final recorded prayer of Samuel, chapter 16. And Samuel was frightened, and in verse 2 he said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. He's now frightened of the man he chose to be king. Saul has gone to pieces, mentally, morally. He's not fit to lead them. And the Amalekites are coming. And God says to Samuel, I want you to go and choose another king. And Samuel says, but Lord, if Saul hears of that, if Saul hears of that, he'll think I'm a rebel. I'm leading a rebellion. He'll come and, and destroy me. But God tells him to go. And Samuel went, and he now learned this, and it's a profound lesson. God guided him in prayer, and God taught him a lesson. It's in the end of verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance, or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. In other words, Samuel, I've been trying to teach you not to judge by outward appearances. Pray to me, and I'll take you to the man that I want. Turned out to be the best king they ever had, King David in Bethlehem, a man after God's own heart. Samuel went to the right man the second time because he didn't let his eyes judge. He let God guide. And that's a real depth of prayer. When you've got to the point in prayer where God can guide you to the most unlikely person, the most unlikely solution, and say, that's the answer, and the Amalekites were beaten. Now then, let me finish. I've got one minute. Hannah and Samuel mother and son, and we've finished at Bethlehem. There is another mother and son of whom you can't help thinking when you read the story of Hannah and Samuel, Mary and Jesus, born in Bethlehem. If you read Mary's prayer when Jesus was conceived and born, you will discover that it's based on Hannah's prayer. Mary the Virgin, the Blessed Virgin Mother of our Lord, was not above using other people's prayers to express her joy. And that's a lovely way to pray sometimes. And this mother that prayed for this boy and knew that she was going to give him to the Lord prayed a prayer that centuries later was used by Mary, whose soul exulted in God her Savior, that God had given her too, a boy, to give to the service of God. And between these two mothers, over the centuries, is a lovely link. They were both mothers of prayer and prophecy. 
And they both produced sons who could pray and get an answer from the Lord, even if it was a hard one. And then they did it. Let us pray. Father, thank you for giving us the privilege of kneeling alongside some of your saints of old and listening to their prayers. Thank you, too, for giving them answers that help us to look for the answers you want to give to us. Speak, Lord. Your servants hear. Amen.